Thank you for having me. Oh, I have an opportunity to say these words because I, I watch a lot of English speaking programming and the guests say, oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> First time to say this. Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host, Oscar Fuchs. Unusual times in China right now. In case you're listening in the future, it's February 2020, and I'm recording this in Shanghai, having returned as planned from my Chinese New Year holiday to Hokkaido. I know many of you listening have been in China throughout the whole coronavirus outbreak, so I think you guys have gone through a lot more of an ordeal than I have so far. But it was definitely a surreal experience flying back into it. The check-in lady at the airport in Japan even called over her manager, who asked us point blank why we were flying to China right now. And even the other Chinese people waiting in line were giving us a side eye. In the end, we simply answered, uh, because it's our home. That seemed to satisfy everyone, and everything after that went pretty smoothly. We're now exactly two-thirds into season one, and I can tell already that the season is going to be split into the pre-coronavirus 20 episodes and the post-coronavirus 10 episodes. So from now on, you can expect me to include little updates on the current situation, just as they relate to the abrupt lifestyle change that we're all experiencing right now in China. But at the same time, I don't want to dwell on it too much. This series was never designed to be a news podcast. These are just human interest stories which can hopefully be enjoyed whenever you listen to them. And if you are listening to them in real time, with any luck, there'll be a nice distraction, especially for those of us in China sitting at home for hours on end in self-quarantine. So today's episode is with Yang Yi. Yi trained as a broadcast journalist, so his answer to the question about his favourite China news source is definitely one to listen out for. Even though this chat was recorded a good few weeks ago, you can really see the things that he says about the Chinese media and the Western media playing out right now. Let me quickly talk about Chinese names. Yang Yi is a Chinese name, so this is a surname followed by a first name. That's why I'm calling him Yi. That's his given name, and Yang is his family name. There shouldn't be too much confusion there. When we say Mao Zedong, we all know that Mao is the family name. The only confusion comes when Chinese people adopt a Western nickname, and in these cases, you don't switch the name order at all. So we've already had Chinese guests like the comedian Maple Tsuo in episode two. But Yi is my first Chinese guest who doesn't go by a Western nickname, so that's why I'm taking the time now to go through it. And to those of you listening who are rolling your eyes at how elementary all of this is, did you know that there is a place in Europe where they also say the surnames first? Yes, it's in Hungary. So I'm hoping even the eye rollers out there might have learned something new. Finally, before we start the episode, let me also warn you that I'm taking you on a bit of an audio quality roller coaster on this one. <laughs> the quality in general isn't great. There was an issue in the studio, but just when you're getting used to it, at the end of the recording, you'll hear a section that we needed to re-record and splice into the main interview. I wouldn't be mentioning this if I had any chance of getting away with it, but yep, you are definitely going to notice this. So please enjoy that nice piece of incompetence. Great to see you here. Um, I'm here with Yang Yi, and Yang Yi is a podcaster here in China. And the podcast that you do uh, and produce is called Left Right. And you're also the editor of a, a podcast newsletter called Just Pod, right? Yeah, the podcast in China is is booming now, but it's just starting booming. It's very emerging industry. Well, this is what we're hopefully going to talk about today. Mm-hmm. But before we start, let me see what is the object that you've brought in today. Okay. Well, I brought.、Uh, What is called the radio receiver? But actually, this is the newest one. My first radio receiver I use is a、uh, since I was maybe three or four years old.、Uh, that is a very big recorder. It can buy recorder, tape players, and radio receiver, and and it's produced by Soviet Union. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yes, but that receiver is very useful because it could receive a very long distance. Signal even from four hundred kilometer, so I don't how Soviet Union use some kind of technology could let let the receiver could do this, but actually it, they could do this. So when you were sitting in your hometown, which was where, by the way,、um, in the middle of China called Huainan, it's a very small town in Anhui Province. So I could、uh, listen to the radio station all around the world: Voice of America, BBC World Service, the radio station from Taiwan. Yeah. Wow. So, well, I I think the radio is receiver is is the most part of my life story because 
when I was just a child, uh, during the、uh, the middle school, writing my homework with this radio receiver, and listen to the program from all around the world. So I remember I I learned about the nine eleven from a shortwave radio. So、hmm. it's faster than any、uh, media outlet in China. Wow. <laughs> And so, I guess this must have been a foundational experience for you. Yeah, of course. So I think the radio taught me a lot. The world is is such big, and people all of the world has the different perspective. Well, let's talk about your growing up in Anhui. What was the kind of media that you were exposed to back then? Well, during my childhood is nineteen nineties. Well, China already have a、uh, the cable television. And there is a lot of TV channels at that time in China because we we use a very different system, not as the UK or the US. Because, like in the US,、uh, maybe everyone could register their own TV stations in a, maybe a small city or a small town. But in China, every province has the television station. Like every state in US has a has a television station. So, they will make a lot of general channels. But they are all general, so they need to buy a lot of programs from overseas. Right. Yeah,、okay. because they didn't have a, that ability to produce so many shows. So in nineteen nineties, I had to watch a lot of shows from overseas, like the TV series, the cartoon,、uh, documentary. Except the news, I could watch every different kind of shows from overseas and translate it into Chinese. Which means from Japan, Korea,、yeah. from Europe, from the U.S. Yeah, most of them from Japan,、um, U.S. and the U.K. So, how does that compare to the way that TV stations broadcast today? Well, it's totally different because now、uh, China has a very big ability to produce their own show, and they learn a lot of different format from the overseas, but they produce by themselves. So, I think maybe at this point. Younger people, they they watch every show from the television set or the streaming service is produced by Chinese. So it depends on Chinese attitude to the world. In my childhood, the show is come from different world. So I still could see, oh, the people in the UK just live like that. The people in the US live like that, like like that. I was living in a very small town in the middle of China. I don't have any opportunity or chance to go abroad at that time. So those television program open the door to the world for me. That's so interesting because I guess in the decade before that, so in the seventies, eighties, they didn't need as much content. And then today, all the content is from China. So you were in this very special little window between those two periods, right? Yes,、yeah, very short period in nineteen nineties. Before that, is not everybody has a TV set in their house, but nineteen nineties is a. Time slot <laughs> for the program from overseas into China. Like I will give an example. You you come from Britain, right? So、um, I had to watch a British television program、uh, when I was around maybe six or seven year old. Actually, I don't know the program at that time, but now I know that program is called Vision On. Vision On, right? <laughs> it's a children programming. I think it's broadcasted. In nineteen eighties, but well, right here is nineteen nineties. I remember the background music of that show. I remember、uh, there is a segment called the gallery, and we will show、uh, the painting from different children,、uh, and this very small segment. But the music is very good. That show in my hometown is broadcast、uh, during the lunchtime. <laughs>、mm. Yeah. Give me the story as to you as a child then, and how does that end up with you becoming、um, interested in broadcasting later on in life?、Mm-hmm. Well,、um, when I was a very little child, maybe three or four years old, I have a goal to become a journalist in the future.、Mm. That concept for me is very earlier, I think, than any other child. <laughs> so、uh, when I was go to the college, my major is about the journalism because it's called. The art of presenting and anchoring. Right. <laughs> yeah, because in well, maybe in the U.S. and in 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 the U.K., the anchorman is a very experienced journalist, but in China,、uh, is a is a major to learn how to use your、uh, voice, something like that. That is my major, 
and when I graduate from the college, I just go to the television station as an editor、uh, for eight years until now. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And so, in terms of the podcasting scene in China, what kind of characteristics are there about podcasts here? Well, now I mentioned before that now in China the podcasting is booming, but is I think it's very early period of that booming. Some people has the habit to listen to something, because in China you know the video it has a very big audience. Right. Whenever I'm on the train, I always see people looking at videos on their yes. phones. Yes,、mm. yes, that's right. And you know the TikTok is very hit. Right.、China. So for audio content, it's very difficult now in China to let people know. Oh, audio still have a a lot of interesting content you can listen to, not just video. But at this point, in many Chinese audience mind, they listen to uh audio content, just want to have more knowledge. It's like online education. Mm. Mm-hmm. So a lecture or a very famous the、uh, the celebrity will teach you some point, and you will pay for that. But it's totally different between the China and the Western countries, right? Because in the English speaking、uh, podcast, you have this rank life, you have serial, you have a storytelling show, right? But in China, there is just one or two storytelling shows. People don't know what is storytelling, and or people even don't think, oh, we could listen to that kind of show because they don't know what is this. After the Cultural Revolution, the radio station needs to reform, right? So at that time, some、uh, radio station in southern China learned from Hong Kong's radio station. You know, the announcer or the presenter don't、uh, need to read the, the the script. They could, you know, speak freestyle and you use the ordinary people's way to talk. That kind of show is very successful.、Uh, and then in the whole nineteen nineties, the radio station everywhere learned that model. Mm. Mm-hmm. And you know that model is very profitable because this is very low cost. Right. You just you just want need to pay the host, so there become a successful business model. Every radio station learn from that. So the radio producers in China's radio station didn't have didn't have any sense about storytelling because storytelling is very high budget to produce, right? And they don't know the audience will love that. They don't know about this. Right, but、uh, you said there are one or two podcasts now that are doing storytelling. So it's starting to break through now, or is it still too early to say? Well, I think it's still early to say, because maybe this one or two podcasts for themselves is successful, but in the whole media industry in China, they're not become a phenomenon. So I, it's very hard to say they already bring podcasting into mainstream. No. Not this point. <laughs> It's interesting because if you look at outside, I mean, let's just take the U.S. for example,、uh-huh. where you get a breakout podcast like Serial, but that's on the back of ten years of slow development, both、mm-hmm. on the radio and podcasting formats. So I guess. It's a little bit difficult to say that China should suddenly catch up if they haven't had this slow ten years progress, right? Yeah, because I I think we are waiting for our serial moment. Right. People use a hit show、uh, through a hit show. Know what is podcasting? Do you think that you have any big predictions, or is that too big a question? Ah, <laughs>、uh, well, for podcasting, I think this thing in China will become industrial. Uh, would become professional and become profitable in the future. Many podcasters in China think podcast a、uh, space for freedom of speech,、mm. but I don't think it is a stable situation, because in the past years, this medium has a very small audience, and someone you know the big brothers don't focus on you. But if this medium become bigger and have more influence. People were focusing on you. People were paying attention on you, so that means you don't have a free speech anymore in this space. So if if you want to keep that kind of free speech in the podcasting, I think it will kill yourself、mm. in in China. Yeah, that makes sense. And in I guess Western countries, we would use things like iTunes, SoundCloud. What is the environment here in China?、Uh, the Himalaya is the biggest one. Do they themselves try and have editorial control over the content? Um. Well, they didn't give the podcaster the editorial content, but they could remove your show or some episode. Okay. 
The reason I wanted to ask that question was to lead into my next question, which was about just in general lifestyle. Because I know that you're a broadcaster, you're a podcaster, but you're also someone who is out there on the LGBT scene as well, right? But it just made me think, you know, how people do try and self-censor, not just on podcasts, but I guess in the way that they live their lives. You strike me as someone who is not really self-censoring the way that you live your life here. Well, in China, I think, well, first, LGBT have their own community. And this community is not, uh, we need to, you know, march on the road or something like that. Uh, This community maybe is a several very close friend, and they will build a WeChat group, and they will talk uh, every day. In the community, I think we didn't have any pressure. We just could talk about our everyday life in that. But to the public, everyone has their different way to face the whole environment. Uh, like me, I, I, I'm come out, so I, I don't want to hide it. But for many people, uh, it's a big pressure. Because maybe someday they will, you know, get married. Maybe the age of 40 or age of 45, they have to face they need to get married. They have this kind of pressure. They are gay or lesbian, but their mind is straight. Oh, I see what you mean. Mm. Yeah. So they still think, oh, marriage is the final goal, and they use that standard. Mm. So that is the things I I have a little bit of worry about that because um, they will take a lot of misunderstanding about this whole community. The straight guys will think, oh, LGBT is not take their responsibility. But uh, I know they have their own pressure, but I don't think it is a good way to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Got it. Do you think that these two lives will intersect, you know, your podcasting life, the LGBT identity? Do you see some interconnectivity in the future for you? Oh, I truly want to produce the LGBT scene the podcast in China. Mm. Because this community has a lot of interesting stories to tell. Mm. I think it is a very good a way to bridge the gap. I think ch- most of Chinese people don't know how to date. Oh, right. <laughs> um, they want to date, but the final goal is to get married. <laughs> so if that is a final goal, they will, will they think a lot about the money, life, the families, something like that. But I think dating is a very simple thing. Dating is just dating. It's just chit-chat. It's just build a connection with two people. And this style of casual dating is not very common in China. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And what about LGBT then? What's the future? Or shall we not talk about that? (laughs) It's harder to say than podcasting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, because the Chinese attitude on LGBT is not very stable. It's flexible. Some years they will become very open to the LGBT community. And some years will become very closed. Mm. Yeah, and maybe it, now it's close. Yeah, it's it. Uh, <laughs> it's great to speak with you about that. And um, let's move on to the second part, which is the ten questions that I ask. Ah, you sent me the question list before, and <laughs> let me think a lot. Because some of questions I never thought before. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Question one: What's your favorite China-related fact? Okay, in Chinese we call Zhong Yong Zhi Dao, but I don't know how to. Translated into English, I searched on the Wikipedia, it's called a Doctrine of the Mean. Doctrine of the Mean, yes. Yeah, I think it's psychology about balance. In my explanation, it means there is nothing too bad or nothing too good. There is nothing truly black or truly white. So Chinese medicine uh, uses this philosophy. In, in Chinese medicine, if you are sick, they didn't try to find a reason behind that. Just keep your body balanced. At that time, when the body keep balanced, you will feel better. Right. I think that is a way for me to explain my life. And when I have some trouble, I will think about that. (laughs) Okay, I'll try to learn that one. Zhong Yong Zhi (laughs) Dao. Zhong Yong Zhi (laughs) Dao. Got it. Well, this is almost the same as question two. Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? Hmm. So that is the difficult question for me. Um, I, I usually say, how <laughs> <laughs> that, that you hear a lot in China. Yeah, how And yeah. Can, you, can you explain that to a non-Chinese person? It's a little bit like, oh, that's fine. Right. And the, the meaning behind that is, maybe it can be better. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, 
I'm sure people living in China have heard that pretty much every day since they got here. <laughs> how about how about? If you left China, what would you miss the most, and what would you miss the least? Oh, um, I miss the most. I think it is efficient life.、Mm. Yeah, because you know China has a 1.4 billion people, huge population here. So the labor cost in China is very low,、mm. which means there is a lot of people could give you different kind of service in China. And it's very cheap, <laughs> and then the subway, because I remember in the U.S. maybe the New York City that has a very big、uh, the the subway transportation system, but in any other cities you have to drive by yourself, right?、Uh, I can't drive, so it's very hard for me to live in the U.S. But I think the efficient life is what I what I mean is about that because、uh, you could choose your way to live in the cities. And no one could judge it. Yeah, is there anything that surprises you about modern life in China?、Mm. Well, I I want to give an example,、uh, like TikTok. Oh yeah, it's a little bit like Snapchat, but、mm. uh, the TikTok is focusing on the video part. Yeah. Well, I'm a video editor for a lot of years, so I think the the application like TikTok, I think it's changed a lot of things. They let people think video is not very difficult thing to make, and they could record their personal life. For me, I think this changed a lot because people has a habit to record everything. And do you think that that will maybe get people more interested in storytelling because everyone is getting used to telling their own stories?、Uh, maybe, maybe. But I think many people use the TikTok just to themselves, like a celebrity, for one minute. <laughs> well, we'll see where that goes, right? I must download TikTok. I still haven't downloaded it, but I find those kind of apps too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite place to go?、Um, you know, to eat, to drink, to hang out. Okay, so this question will show my boring part. <laughs> <laughs> I think usually a friend will recommend some restaurant or coffee shop, and they will bring me there. And at that time, I will give a score. So、oh, this restaurant is good, but it doesn't mean I will come back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or it doesn't mean it is my favorite because I think if you if you see the places is is your favorite, you will go there for a lot of times, right? So if you have to say the places I usually go, a small noodle restaurant near my house, I will go there every day. <laughs> but This is my favorite. I don't think so. <laughs> I think, I think that's one way of defining favorite. If, okay. If you go there that often, then I think that counts. Uh huh. What kind of noodles is that noodle shop? It's a it's a very traditional Chinese noodle. Um, that one. Oh, la- large intestines. Yeah.、Uh-huh. Okay. But it's it pigs. <laughs> pigs organs, <laughs>、yeah. right? It's very delicious, but I don't know is this the most delicious. But for me, I think oh, it's delicious to eat. <laughs> so how often would you go there? Maybe three times a week. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah, because it's very close to my. Yeah,、house. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What is the best or worst purchase you've recently made? Well, I usually buy books, not any other things. If I buy any other purchase, is something I truly need to use, like a new microphone, <laughs>、right. new recorder, but I. Uh, if we talk about a book, recently I I read a book,、um, The Fifth Risk,、um, written by Michael Lewis. That's fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction is、mm. talking about the Trump administration. Oh, got it. <laughs> But it's very different angle. Interesting. It's just want to explain how Trump truly give influence on the U.S. government system.、Mm. So you tend to buy the actual books. You don't tend to do the electronic version. Oh. I try electronic version. I I, I try Kindle before, but finally I think、uh, the physical book is better. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the same. But maybe we're dying out our generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite WeChat sticker? So、uh, it's about ha. Yeah, it's a very interesting, popular phenomenon in China.、Um, it's relative with the, the former president Jiang Zemin. Okay. And、uh, now he's. Uh, more than eighty years old, and he has a lot of younger fan, because、uh, the younger person think he is interesting, and people love him, 
and we will, we make a lot of different stickers about him. So I show you uh, one is about uh, plus one second, plus one second. <laughs> it's the best wishes to the old person, <laughs> to him. Ah, uh, so what what it means is to to keep on living, keep living, keep living. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Wow, I'm glad you explained it. I would not have understood that well, without that. Okay, Chinese leader is just always poker face. So that's very active. So we never seen this before. Oh, how funny! Next question. Okay. What is your favorite go-to song to、oh. sing at KTV? Okay, here is a song in Chinese called "Zui Xue Min Zu Feng," and it's a song of miracle. <laughs> okay. So, well, this is not my favorite song, but I think it is my go-to song. You know, to in a karaoke, because it's a very good song for warming up. Ah. And for me, I think oh, entertain my friend is very important thing for me. You know, sometimes when we go to a KTV, the first twenty minutes is very embarrassing, right? Someone is picking their own song. Someone is order drink and food. Someone is chit chat, and no one is focusing on singing. So this song is, you know, how does it is? It, it kind of makes everyone feel energetic, or yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So it's very good way to pay attention. Everyone pay attention to you, right? I I just hate that, that, that embarrassed half an hour. <laughs> yeah. I think oh I should broke this situation. I need to do something. You're you're a very useful person to have at KTV, I think. <laughs> And finally, what other China-related media or sources of information do、uh, you rely on?、Um, well, if a Chinese media, I think it's Haixin Media is a bad choice.、Uh, but it's、uh, it's in Chinese language. It's just a professional news because. FT and Bloomberg in English world is still a very useful. Right, so it's like the equivalent of of FT, right? Yeah, and I think the financial news is a good point in China to you know open a very small door for news. <laughs> yeah, well said.、Uh-huh. And if you talk about English,、uh, in my mind, I think foreign media for China is very useful because you have a freedom of speech. So you could, you have an opportunity to cover a lot of issues that Chinese media can cover, but a lot of Western media surely have a stereotype on China on most of Chinese issues. Yeah. And I am a still an editor and journalist. I know that feeling is, well, I have a storyline. I want to introduce someone to you know fill into that blank, fill in that blank, and I think sometimes it depends on some stereotype. If they have opportunity to get some new discover, they don't want to go into that. It is oh, that's that's not my storyline. Yes, no, just, yes, because it doesn't fit the story that I want to write. Yeah, but I am a big fan for foreign media, actually. But I still find their Chinese coverage has some problem like that. So that's a little bit, you know, for me, it's very little bit combination. Yeah, <laughs> I like that, and I like that you you can look at Caixin, and then you can look at foreign media, and then you can find that somewhere in between there is something called the truth.、Uh-huh. Thank you so much for your time today, E. Oh, thank you, Oscar. <laughs> really, really interesting. We covered quite a few different topics here, and the last thing I will ask you before you leave is: out of everyone who you know in China, who should I interview in the next season of Mosaic of China? Okay, I nominate Chu Yang. She's one of my friends, and、uh, she's very interesting girl because she is tough.、Mm. So、uh, I think she will be very interesting. There are some kind of very challenging and tough persons in China to care about the world issues, the feminism issues, and she was a journalist, so it's maybe some issues about journalism in China. So I think she have a lot of topic for you to talk with. <laughs> That sounds great. I'm interested and intimidated at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, E. Thank you for having me. Oh, I have an opportunity to say these words because I I watch a lot of English speaking programming and the guests say, "Oh, thank you for having me." <laughs> First time to say this. You said it very well. Thank you too.、Uh, thank you. So the main thing to unpack from today's episode is the word "ha" that E casually mentioned when describing the Jiang Zemin sticker. This "ha" means toad. I won't go into all the details here, but you can look up toad worship on the internet to find out more. I kid you not. It really reminds me of episode 16 when Nini talked about llamas. 
sometimes the simplest of things have a hidden complexity in China, especially when it comes to evading the senses. The Jiangzi Min WeChat sticker is, of course, on social media. If you're in the WeChat group, you'll have seen the original sticker. To join, please add me on my ID Oscar10877, and I'll add you there myself. And otherwise, you can see screenshots of the sticker on Instagram and Facebook. So just search for Mosaic of China, or one word, and you'll find them there. Apart from the sticker, there are lots of other images online this week. We have E with his object, his radio, and E was back in his hometown of Huainan over the Chinese New Year, so he was able to take a photo of the original radio made in the Soviet Union, which he mentioned. There's also a couple of photos from Huainan itself. E described it as a very small town in our chat, but it didn't surprise me to discover that it has 2.3 million inhabitants. I've posted E's phrase in Chinese, "hao ba," which means something like, "Well, all right then." That's in contrast to "hao de," which is a more emphatic way of saying yes or okay. There's also the logo of Vision On, the program from the UK that was aired at lunchtimes in Anhui in the 90s. Vision On actually originally aired on BBC One in the UK in the 60s and 70s, so a long time before it came to Anhui, and it was originally designed specifically for children with hearing impairments. It's a little bit before my time, but I've definitely heard of it, and I'm sure most of the Brits out there have too. Speaking of programs, he mentioned that there are a couple of storytelling shows breaking through in the China podcast space at the moment. The most famous of these is definitely Gusha FM. If you can understand Mandarin, I would really recommend it. And the exciting news is that E himself has put his money where his mouth is. Since we recorded this interview together, he has quit his day job at the TV station and is now a full-time podcaster. More than that, he has also co-founded China's first podcasting company called Just Pod, which now produces a bunch of different shows. So I'm really excited for E, and I can't wait to see where he and the other China podcasters like him takes this medium in the future. There are lots of other images, but I am taking too much time, so I'll just let you discover them for yourselves. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs. Artwork by Denny Newell, and extra support from Milo De Prieto and Alston Gong. I am still planning on being here next week, and I hope the same goes for you.